Achtung, Achtung. Welcome. We have ways of making you talk, listeners, to another edition of We Have Ways of Making You Talk. You've, you've, you're on the right podcast. Now, um, in the podcast frontier broadcasting world, which is what this is, how do I get onto We Have Ways of Making You Talk? Is a question many of you have maybe asked yourselves. Um, and what it really pays is to be related to either James Holland or I. My father was on back in uh, May. And we are delighted to be joined today um, in a what our producer called a double Dutch um, uh, lineup, which I, I'm not going to engage in. Any of that sort of low humour. We're delighted to be joined by by Tom Holland. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And your study in the background is as impressive as James's. Um, our regular listeners, or our rather our viewers on the Patreon, are familiar with James's wall of books and giant almanacs of Battle of Britain casualties and. And of course, his short magazine Lee Enfield at the corner. I see you have a you have a, a more elegant weapon for a more elegant time behind you. I, I've I've got a Norman shield. Uh, I've got two swords. I've got a Roman helmet. I've got a Norman helmet. So um, I, I need to uh, bank on the fact that um, when the balloon goes up, there'll be no petrol. <laughs> Well, seeing as you've a Roman helmet, and Norman helmet, Norman shield, what on earth are you doing on this podcast? <laughs> well, this is sec- the Second World War. <laughs> well, my brother runs it. <laughs> well, I, there's two things here. First of all, I just want to point out that that it was me that gave you the Roman helmet and the Norman helmet and the two swords, or or certainly a dagger and a sword. Uh, and that's a very good question. Why would someone who is famous for uh, writing books about the history of Islam and Christianity and the rise and fall of the Roman Republic, etc., etc., um, beyond this? Well, OK, so the other day, um, my bro and I were down in Cornwall and we were walking along, along a coastline and I was sort of, you know, talking about World War Two, as is my way, Um <laughs> And uh, I would say, well, of course, one of the things about the kind of, you know, the allied armies was they get an awful lot of criticism for being stodgy. And, you know, and I was I don't mind admitting it. I was talking about the operational level and um, and, uh, and and being risk averse. And Tom said, well, the Romans were completely risk averse. Um, and, and I thought that was amazing because obviously they were not bad at kind of conquering lands as well. Well, and have a reputation for, for brutality, too. So they, they cared about their own lives, but not the other people's. That, that's interesting. Tom? Um, yes, yeah, so, so essentially what built the Roman Empire was um, the Roman enthusiasm for digging things. So when the Roman army marched, they would um, take swords, of course, and spears and shields, but they would also take shovels and picks. And in a way, the shovels and picks were more important. Um, there's a case for saying that the legions essentially were an engineering outfit, who were occasionally called upon to fight. I know that that kind of goes against the kind of the image of, 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 of the Roman army as this kind of lethal killing machine, which it also was. The Roman understanding was that you, you couldn't kill barbarians unless you had a secure base. So the priority when marching into enemy territory was to dig a fortification, to settle down, and then to use that as a base from which to repel any ambushes. And hopefully um, when you get the chance to wipe out a few uh, Germans or Gauls or Goths or whatever, um, then you take full advantage of it. But the, 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 the thing that um, caused a, a Roman general, and I would guess the entire mass of the Roman soldiery, absolute palpitations was the idea of not having a base to retreat back to. And it was always the policy of a Roman general. If they were in a civil war, they would always make sure that they would capture the opponent's uh, base because then they could be absolutely certain that they would gain victory. So if that is if that's kind of redolent of um, of, the, of the, the the Allied approach to uh, to war, that's probably you know the Romans always won and the Allies won. So it might be a, a useful strategy. Gosh, that's very interesting. I mean, in in a way that I went to. I mean, I went and James has been as well. I went to Camp Bastion five years ago. And uh, you immediately were conjuring up an image there for me of that enormous sort of citadel in the Afghan desert, desert nowhere near anything that they would send patrols out to br- brass up the the, the 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 local villains and then and then retreat back into the base. Uh, but the, the engineering is at the key, the core of the Allied effort in in the, in the sec- certainly. I mean, you you can't talk about D Day without talking about an engineering effort that the sheer the scale of it and basically the establishment of a lodgment of a base from which then you can roll forward. But were the, were the Romans, were the Romans uh, doing this because this was the way to win or because they cared about Roman, their own lives, their own casualties? Well, both. Um, manpower is incredibly important. 
Um, and one of the reasons why um, Rome emerges from being this kind of outpost of, of cattle rustlers camped out among marshes and bogs to become the greatest power in the world is that they hoard their manpower. And whenever they annex other people, they, make, they, they tie them up with treaties that obliges them to supply them with manpower. So they understand that the larger your army, the likely you are to win. Um, but, 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 but equally, I think it's, it, 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 it is absolutely a kind of safety first approach that they knew, <laughs> they knew worked. Um, and I think also, you know, you talk about engineering. One of the things, that, of course, in the context of the Second World War, is that both sides were absolutely steeped in classical learning, at least the, 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 the commanders, um, to a degree that would, would not be the case today. The generals on the Allied side, particularly the British, were, you know, they, they, they'd all studied classical languages at their private schools. They had um, been raised to view the British Empire as, in, <laughs> in a way, a kind of a, a model uh, modelled on the Roman Empire. They identified very strongly with the, the, the figure of Augustus, the figures of Julius Caesar. They saw themselves as, as the heirs of, of Roman civilization. But <laughs> so too did the Nazis. And Hitler in particular... I hugely admired the Romans for their engineering feats, for their architectural feats. Uh, he 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 adored Rome. I mean, he said he when he went to Paris, you know, he 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 basically forgot Paris. But when he went to Rome, it stuck in the mind, and he saw Rome as the great exemplar. In fact, actually, also the great rival that had to be overcome. So when he was looking to build rebuild Berlin, he wanted to outdo Rome. But there was a further aspect of Roman military culture that I think appealed to the Nazis more than to the Allies. And that was their ability to harness engineering genius with um, e extremes of cruelty. The Romans understood that the combination of engineering proficiency and a willing to engage in mass atrocity was a completely winning formula. And Hitler certainly absolutely... You know, he, he, he saw this as the prototype and he saw it as the prototype, not just because it was an, exa an example from history that could be followed. He saw it as a, essentially the model of how to fight war that the Aryans should conduct. Hitler believed that the Romans, the Athenians, the Spartans in all their golden ages were of Nordic stock, that um, the achievements of Rome, the achievements of Sparta, the achievements of Athens were the achievements of his own people, of the Aryan people. You know, Hitler's contempt for the kind of Himmler idea that the genius of the German people lay in the pots that Himmler's archaeologists were doing. Himmler, Hitler regarded these as, you know, as contemptible. What Hitler identified with was the power, the might, the glamour of the great apex predators of classical antiquity. Just before, I just want to make a point about the fact that all the all the commanders and but on both sides knew their classical history because um, people who've been listening to this podcast will know that I kind of bang on occasionally about Francis Tuca, and Tuca does this amazing book called Approach to Battle, which one day we're hoping to um, see back in print. Um, uh, and actually, he looks at the Battle of Cannae and and kind of uses that as an example about how you should conduct battles even in the Second World War. And the other thing that's really interesting interesting is that by the summer of 1942 you know the British certainly sort of go right from now on we're going to have no more retreat we're not we're, we're gonna we're gonna whatever the front line is that stays the front line and we go forward we don't go backwards anymore which is it strikes me when you were talking about it the other day bro is that it's quite a um, quite a sort of Roman approach I mean I know that they have their bases from which they they can retreat but it's that kind of risk averse not risk averse it's about being making sure that you don't get yourself into a position where you can be defeated um, as much as you possibly can which seems to me incredibly sensible I don't know really why you know if it worked for the Romans why the Allies have been criticized for it in the Second World War it is really interesting about what you're saying about about Hitler because Himmler is certainly into all this kind of sort of wacky stuff isn't he and you know Christ and Iceland theory and all that kind of stuff and Spear of Destiny and the Arn and Erba. But, but what you're saying is that Hitler's not really interested in all that at all. No. Um, Hitler identifies very strongly with, um, with Sparta. He, he, he regarded um, Sparta as the most perfectly racist society that had ever existed. And obviously for Hitler this was, 
this is high praise indeed. And the, 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 the Spartans were a kind of very militantly eugenicist people. They'd been a kind of bog standard Greek city state. And then essentially they, they had this kind of revolution where every Spartan citizen committed himself to the art of warfare. Every Spartan woman was committed to the idea that she had to breed uh, heroes for the future. And this city-state turned into this kind of terrifying mutant predator that then went on the attack and annexed its neighbours, the city-state of Messenia, and, and, and uh, stupefyingly, because this is not what the Greeks generally did, conquered the whole territory and turned the, um, the Messenians into, into slaves, what they called helots. This for, for Hitler seemed absolutely the way to go. Hitler viewed the Spartans, they were, they were, they're, they're just, you know, Helen of Troy is from Sparta, it's kind of blonde haired, this idea that the Spartans were an authentically Nordic people. They had a, an absolutely revolting cuisine, a kind of black broth that Hitler traced from its origins in Schleswig-Holstein. So he was convinced that the Spartans were a kind of outpost of Germans planted in the Peloponnese in southern Greece and therefore were the ideal model for um, the Nazi war machine. And so particularly uh, Heydrich, I think, when he was um, talking about um, how uh, occupied territory in Poland and, and, and Russia should be administered, specifically invoked the example of, of how the Spartans had treated the Helots. This was the programme. Helots were not, you know, they weren't allowed to be educated. They were, they were kind of spiritually and morally degraded by becoming drunk. Um, the Spartan, the Spartan education system, the best, the kind of the, the the senior prefects, if you like, would be enrolled into this terrifying organization called the Cryptea, kind of the, literally the secret service. And the way that you would kind of um, earn your spurs, you kind of, you learn a kind of badge to put on your school blazer or whatever, was you'd go and you'd literally kill a helot. You know, if there was any kind of uppity helot, anyone who showed any ability or, or anything like that, um, you'd go out and kill them. So, the Spartans were interested in honing their own stock as a kind of master race and degrading the Messenians so that only those who were sluggish, stupid, doltish, obedient, servile would breed. They understood that. And so you can absolutely see the appeal of this for, for Hitler, for Heydrich, for the German commanders in the occupied territories in the east. I, I, I mean, in the, in the table talk and, all the, uh, and Hitler's ramblings, helot is a word that's used an awful lot. Is this the... St the I mean, uh, the problem... Not the problem. One of the things about antiquity is who's telling us this about the Spartans? Is this their enemies saying, oh, God, what these these people are um, they're, they're this crazy uh, proto racist military state that, that, that treats its slaves terribly the way we never would. Or is this the Spartans telling us is this coming direct from Sparta, this information about Sparta, if you see what I mean? The Spartans don't write because the Spartans are busy. I mean, they have poetry, they have kind of marching songs, but they don't sit down and write philosophy. Uh, they don't write history. Um, they don't build buildings even. So uh, Thucydides in History of the Peloponnesian War famously says that, that, that were the Spartans to be wiped out and future generations go to Sparta, they would look and they would not believe that the Spartans were as powerful as, as people said, because there's nothing there to see. So essentially, historians refer to, the, to, to Sparta as a mirage, the Spartan mirage, because it, it is a kind of creation of foreigners, particularly of Athenians, who are obsessed with Sparta in the way that... Um, kind of upper class intellectuals in the 30s were obsessed with the Soviet Union. Um, even though Sparta was the kind of the great enemy of Athens, high born kind of elitist intellectuals in Athens were obsessed with Sparta, Plato most famously. And so they do construct this image of, of a kind of Sparta as an ideal state. And that's how it passes into the bloodstream of Europe. So Thomas More, when he writes Utopia in the 16th century, is modelling that on, uh, on Sparta. And the, so the private school system, which we've already talked about in, in Britain, again, is very consciously modelled on the Spartan system of bringing up tough people. Uh, that's what it's all about. But the Nazis do push it to kind of incredible extremes. And what Hitler does is he, he brings his, his assumption that everything is predicated and to be explained by race 
to ancient history. And so that's why he sees and interprets Sparta entirely in racial terms. And other Nazi ideologues, for instance, interpret Plato when he writes The Republic, which is Plato's idea of how you organise an ideal state. And Plato's very big on the idea that uh, people of different abilities should serve different roles. So if you're suited to govern, then you govern. If you're suited to be a cobbler, if you're suited to be a, a, a slave, then those are the roles that you fulfil. Nazi ideologues interpret these in overtly racist manners. And they say that, the you know, as in Sparta, so in Athens, Plato is writing about the Athenian aristocracy, who are the Aryans, and Plato, therefore, is saying that Aryans should rule the lesser stock that the Athenian elites have conquered. This is how the Nazis understand Roman Republican history. So in Rome, you have a, a, a class system where you have patricians who are a hereditary class of aristocrats who basically kick sand in the face of the lower classes who are called plebeians. And the Nazis inevitably say, well, the patricians are a kind of Fuhrer aristocracy. You know, they use the word Fuhrer to describe the aristocrats of the Roman Republic. These are the, 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 the Nordic stock who have conquered uh, Latium and the plebeians are of kind of lesser stock. And it's the, the Roman Nordic aristocracy who fuse and shape the whole city of Rome into the killing machine that it becomes. But that's essentially how the Nazis explain the achievements of Sparta, Athens and Rome, who are the three great kind of exemplars. So what you're saying is that their ideological approach to Untermenschen uh, and, uh, and, and various undesirables, whether it be Jews or gypsies or Slavs or whatever, that is Hitler is modelling his approach on the Spartans' approach to Hellas. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I think he draws inspiration from it. I, I think it, it, it provides him with a kind of obvious model. Hitler is sufficiently respectful of history that, that the fact that the Spartans are doing it gives it a kind of cachet. But, but, but as I said, it's also that he feels that um, by, by emulating what the Spartans did, he's being true to this kind of Nordic inheritance, that, that, that it's in the way the Spartans organise their society that um, you know, good Nazis can feel that they are paying homage to their ancestral past, rather than by going around digging up, you know, a few pots. I mean, it's not. It, it, he wouldn't be the first person to use ancient history to underwrite his um, contemporary view, though, would he? It, it sounds so peculiar because it's coming through this Nazi prism, which, after all, is um, doing two things: is it's self-consciously looking forward to a new morality that's post-Christian. And also back to an, another morality that's pre-Christian, and uh, uh, you've you've just written a book about exactly that um, uh, idea, haven't you, Tom? Uh, that the, the, the Nazis are the Nazis are quite deliberate. Hitler, Hitler, you know, he takes his time politically to go to war with the Church, and he's doing it. He's doing it to chip away at other other um, uh, bastions of moral authority in the German in the German sort of body politic. But he's also doing it because. He, he, because he doesn't want competition in that regard, is he doesn't like, he doesn't like Christianity. He's, he, he doesn't, he doesn't value it, doesn't rate it, doesn't buy it on any level, does he? Uh, he positively detests it. Um, because, of course, hanging over um, idol worship of antiquity is the, the uncomfortable fact that, that Sparta and Athens and most famously Rome end up falling. They decline and fall. Um, and so if you're, you, know, you you want to establish a Reich, an empire, and you have loads of eagles, and you're you're you know you want to rebuild Berlin to be greater than Rome. The shadow hanging over it is that it will it will collapse and fall. So wh why does Rome fall? This is of course the great question. And and Hitler's theory as to why Rome falls, you can guess who he blames it on. He blames it on the Jews because the Jews turn up and they infect the pure Nordic racists of Athens and Rome, with their sinister cosmopolitan concern for the weak and the feeble. And the person whom Hitler blames more than anyone else for the collapse of, of Rome is St. Paul, who, uh, of course, is a Jew. And Hitler sees Paul's Jewishness as a kind of expression of resentment and envy. It's it's the it's the envy of of the worm for the warrior. It's the 
envy of the, the basilisk for the, for the mighty lion. And so Paul and this pernicious, cancerous way of understanding the world that Paul seeds across the Rome, like a kind of, like kind of COVID going around. You know, Paul goes around the Roman Empire and everywhere he goes, he's like a kind of walking coronavirus seeding the health of the healthy Roman Empire with this kind of this idea that there is no Jew or Greek, as Paul says, and that Christ, by dying on the cross, has triumphed over the torturer, that yeah, yeah. Um, the slave has triumphed over the master. And this is these, these, these two doctrines, the idea that all humans are created equally and, and have an equal dignity, and the idea that um, the slave can triumph over the master, that the weak can triumph over the strong. These are the doctrines that end up sapping and ultimately destroying Roman power. And so Hitler sees this as the great challenge that faces the Third Reich. If, if, if Hitler, if the Nazis win the war, if they, um, they, they establish their Thousand Year Reich, what is to, to give it its, its millennial term? What is to give, you know, how will it stand true? It, it can only stand true if the Jews are wiped out and if therefore if Christianity is wiped out as well. And ultimately, this is, I think, the kind of the most grotesque paradox in the entire history of Christian anti-Semitism, which is a kind of long, sordid, miserable story. But Hitler essentially targets the Jews for genocide because he blames them for Christianity. Yeah, I wow. mean, in theory, it was a it was a sort of amongst uh, amongst um, anti-Semites, you know, the modern the early 20th century anti-Semites. This was this was a, you know, Jesus was a Jew. It's another Jewish idea um, that's been sent to corrupt and undermine in the way that, of course, capitalism is, is, the, is the fault of the Jews. Communism is the fault of the Jews. It, 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 again, it's everything goes through his racial prism, his racial theor theoretical prism and delivers blame at the Jews regardless. And it's it, 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 I mean, it's sort of. When you when you when you start reading what Hitler thinks about things like this, it's very hard to get your head around because it's because because he's doing these the politics of it's going on, but he's also he also believes this stuff, and we've talked about this a lot in the podcast. You've actually got to, he actually believes this. They actually believe this. They do, and they act on their beliefs, which is quite extraordinary. And at the same time, he's portraying himself as messianic. He's using Christian language. He's using. Uh, quite self-consciously using using the lingua franca of Christian religion that, that that Germans are really super familiar with. You know the the birthplace of the Reformation of Luther. The German language is invented through um, uh, the Christian Reformation in the 16th century, and Hitler's using using some of that garb to sell himself to the German people. It's quite an, it, the brew it, that he comes up with is quite extraordinary, isn't it? Well, it, it's interesting you said that, that Hitler sees Jesus as a Jew, because what's fascinating is that actually Hitler, even Hitler, can't quite bring himself to condemn Jesus. And so <laughs> Hitler and, and, and many Nazis buy into this idea, which actually ironically is a kind of um, something that the, 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 the rabbis and the Talmudic period propagate, which is that Jesus was the son of a Roman centurion called Panthera. This idea that that, that, that that therefore perhaps he that Panther was 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 of Nordic stock, so therefore Jesus was actually Aryan. So you're right that that that, that even as as Hitler and particularly Himmler, who really detested Christianity and kind of drew up this forty year program to eliminate it completely, they did recognise that there was value in the in in aspects of Christianity. Um, Chief of which, again, as you said, with Luther, is that, that Luther was a massive anti-Semite. You know, there was lots that you could do with that. They, the, the, there's a big conference that the, the, the Lutheran Church hold in the Wartburg, which is where um, Luther um, mm -hmm. went um, to, to, to translate the, 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 the New Testament into German. So the kind of foundational text of, of German Protestantism. And there they, they meet up and they, they, they develop this kind of heresy whereby... Everything Jewish in the Bible has to be purged, which, of course, doesn't leave you very much. Um, but essentially, the argument is, is that the, the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. Um, it's kind of it, it was originally propagated in the second century by a, a, a heretic called Marcion. And this is what the Lutheran Church buy into. When I wrote Dominion, the um, the book you very kindly alluded to <coughs> out this week, um, I, I, I kind of drew on um, Lord of the Rings, which was being written by Tolkien 
uh, at exactly this period. He was writing it over the course of the Second World War. Essentially, what the, the Nazis wanted to do with Christianity was what Sauron wanted to do with the um, the wraiths <laughs> who succumbed to the power of the ring. He wanted them to be turned and perverted and changed to agents of evil so that they could be, then become servants of, of, of Nazism and fascism. But obviously, any, any, any form of Christianity that was compatible with National Socialism wasn't going to be anything that <laughs> any Christian would, would, over the course of the previous 2,000 years, would have recognised. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. We're talking to Tom Holland about Hitler and Rome. I'm just bog- I'm boggled by all of this. Uh, when you try and get in, in, into Hitler's thinking, then consider the, how he was then able to influence a, a whole people into running along with a lot of this thinking. Because after all, he, there are plenty of people who become enthusiastic Nazis, um, who embrace cruelty and power through cruelty and all the things we've been talking about and the reject the complete rejection of any christian ideal the eternal question is how did why did this appeal to people in in such to such an extent how did how did he get people how did he get people to buy this i mean james is probably going to finish my thought for me i hope you know when it when it all comes tumbling down in in 1918 1919 there is this sort of they're such a reduced nation you know there's this this great nation of military prowess of of amazing engineering feats of science of modernity and they and they're, they're so reduced and then you know out of the second half of the 1920s things starting to get, look a sort of a little bit better actually then comes the wall street crash which is when the nazis suddenly start to kind of take hold again in that in that chaos that follows the wall street crash and the drying up of american loads which is sort of propping up the german recovery and suddenly it's back to square one and and and, you know you just see this over and over and over again don't you when when there are major financial crises there is a there is a sort of a a resurgence of nationalism and there is a a, a resurgence for a a different way you know the politicians have failed the existing system has failed us so you know what the nazis are doing is is appealing to um, traditional values of militarism and pride and prowess and in German excellence and, and detail and technological advancement and all the rest of it, but with their own twist, which is saying, you know, actually what we can do is we can we can take all that, but we can actually improve on this. We can we can make us the greatest nation in the world. We can, you know, what and what the pro- the problem? What's really caused the problem? Uh, uh, the Jews and, and the threat of Bolshevism, which is hovering in the east, which is is going to be like a sort of you know a sw- you know some terrible sway that's if we're not careful, if we're not strong enough, is going to come over and envelop us and 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 make your lives even more miserable. You know, everything that we hold firm, all our kind of you know that sort of right-wing nationalism stuff that's going to be swept away by 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 bolshevism and he's able to come to power with this message at a time just when the economy is turning and so suddenly that all sounds quite appealing and he gets in and then the things sort of play into you know but they sort of play into his into, into the rhetoric quite well the economics start playing into the rhetoric quite well and then he's able to get his victories and stuff uh, all without a shot being fired and everyone goes what's not to like but even then i can't see how you pitch into where 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 you end up you know uh that's what's i mean th- that's the thing that's remarkable especially when when you start actually parsing his thinking and pulling it apart and looking at it and seeing what it seeing what it entails you, you know like i said germany's the germany's the birthplace place of the reformation it's somewhere with christianity as as much as anywhere else in western europe right through its cultural core and nazism is a is a direct rejection of it well i i think that that actually the the, the classical inheritance here does have a quite an important role to play i mean obviously i may be overemphasizing it but 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 i do I, I do think it does have a kind of role to play because we've we've talked about how the british identified with the romans the french did as well napoleon modeled himself on on, on the, i mean basically everyone in europe if they wanted to be a great power the the the, the model of rome was irresistible but the, the germans had a peculiarly potent and 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 profound relationship with the classical inheritance. The Germans identified very strongly with the Romans. They'd been doing that since, you know, um, the the 10th century. The Holy Roman Empire was based in Germany, essentially. But since the Romantic period, the Germans had also identified very, very strongly with Greece. 
Um, they they saw themselves as as Greek culturally, if not racially. And so what Hitler did essentially was to give to intellectuals, artists, anyone essentially who had come into contact with the, 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 the deep German enthusiasm for ancient Greece, the possibility of a kind of more intense sense of identification with that inheritance. So when, when the Germans invade Greece and they, you know, they force the pass of Thermopylae, where the Spartans had, had stood and been wiped out by the Persians, and they, they, they knock the British out from, from Thermopylae and they march into Athens and the swastika flies over the Acropolis. Um, Hitler is able to tell the Germans that you, the Germans, are closer to the ancient Greeks than the modern Greeks. The modern Greeks are a bastardised Slavic people. The, the, the golden age of Athens and, and, and Sparta has gone. It's been racially corrupted. Uh, their, their, their descendants have, have vanished. You, the German people, you are the true ancient Greeks. And so by occupying the Acropolis, it, they weren't foreign occupiers. They were reclaiming what was their own. And likewise with, with, with Rome, um, Hitler identifies very, very powerfully with Augustus. In, in, in 1937, Mussolini stages a great exhibition in Rome because it's the 2000th anniversary of Augustus's birth. Hitler goes twice to see it. Augustus had been emperor in AD 9 when three legions were, who had failed to build a palisade, failed to build a camp, were wiped out uh, amid the bogs of, of, of northern Germany by um, a, a, a German warlord called Arminius. Um, and this essentially is what prevented um, Germany from being Romanized. And this, for, for lots of Nazis, was a source of great pride. And they identified with, with Himmler was into. Um, Himmler was into the idea that the heroic Germans had seen off the Romans. But Hitler's perspective was slightly different. He admired Arminius, but he admired Arminius not because he was a German, but because he'd been Romanized. Arminius, it's a, it's a Roman name. Arminius had served in the Roman army. So he saw, Hitler saw Arminius as a model. He was a German who had been Romanized and therefore had been able to defeat the Romans themselves. But he still identified with Augustus as well. And Augustus found a city that was made of brick and left it a city made of marble. So Augustus is a <clears throat> conscious model. So Arminius and Augustus, the two enemies, Hitler sees himself as reconciling these two traditions. And again, this is something that kind of appeals to the vanity of the Germans, just as, as for the British, identifying themselves with the Romans appeal to their vanity. This is something that, that, that I think simply because of the intensity of the German relationship to the classical inheritance, is, it, 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 it provides a kind of way for Hitler to desensitise many Germans to the kind of anti-Christian tradition that Nazism embodies. And there's certainly no doubt that, you know, when you're looking at the models, you know, the famous model that, that Albert Speer creates of what is going to become Germania, which, of course, is the ancient Roman word for, the, for that part of Germany anyway, isn't it? Uh, um, you know, Germania is absolutely built on the same sort of uh, um, model of, of ancient Rome with its long avenues where triumphs can be kind of, you know, taken um, with the huge uh, Volkshalle, which is this huge, you know, it's going to have the big, biggest unsuspended dome ever in the world and house 160,000 people. You know, Nazi architecture is, is um, you know, it doesn't have the same kind of, of sort of um, flourishes that, that ancient Greek and ancient Roman architecture has, but it's built on very much the same principles, isn't it? I mean, you've only got to go and look at the old propaganda ministry or the old air ministry in, in um, Friedrichstrasse and you kind of realise exactly where it's all, all coming from. Um, but, but you know, Al, to go back to your point, I mean, you know, why do so many people buy into this? I, I still think it's because they want Germany to be great. They want to be part of a hugely successful country and one of the great things that the you know one of the things that the German, the nazis are very successful at of course is propaganda and it's this this sort of overall brainwashing isn't it it's this kind of you know you know through the radio through the through the cinema through the uh, um through newspapers and the press is this constant drip 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 feed of basically the same message and you know hitler writes about this in mein kampf and 
you know, people know where he's coming from. Uh, and these ideas of sort of racial purity of kind of, you know, if we don't, if we don't be, you know, if we're not strong, if we don't make this sacrifice of kind of having to face up and slaughter millions of people now, you know, future generations are going to suffer. That That's something that people just buy into because basically saying what they want to hear, i.e. Germany can be great again, but getting them to buy into the sacrifices that have to be involved in achieving that and couched in in his own sort of messianic uh, posture which is the other the other truly peculiar thing about it is is he is you know he 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 he, uh, he, he turns up at nuremberg like christ entering jerusalem it's it's the it's got all that built into it too which is i think really which is really really i i, I you know there are so many striking things about how these ideas catch on the clear hunger in germany for someone to come along and solve solve everyone's problems uh, that 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 characterizes so much of of how they position themselves and then the way the debate goes and and of, obviously you know some of it built, based quite self-consciously on Mussolini's own self-conscious evocation of ancient Rome too so that 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 the the, the, the brew um, that gets that gets Hitler over the line, and then there's, I mean, like you say, everyone's red mind camp. They ought to, they jolly well ought to know what they're voting for, or what they're going to get. And these he's very peculiar as politicians go, Hitler, isn't he? Because he does exactly what he says he's going to do. Um, he 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 keeps his he keep unless he's lying to you, he keeps his promises. It's, that's the striking thing about him, isn't it? He he absolutely says, well, I'm going to do this, and does it. Which I think compared, which he's then able to use to compare himself against all the all the terrible milk toasts of social democracy who've who've backslid and proposed things and failed along the way. So the sort of messianic element is really interesting too. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that um, there were people who who looked at what Hitler had written and said, drew the conclusion of where he'd be going even even before the start of the war. So someone very striking who does this is Simon Weil in France who in 1938 writes an essay saying, explicitly comparing um, the Nazis to the Romans. And she's doing that as, as, as someone in France, because the French are, are, are busy saying, you know, where have the Nazis come from? Does this lie in the, in, in, in the mists of Germany? Is there something specific about German civilization? Um, and very kind of, I think much more shrewdly, essentially she looks back to Nietzsche, who, who the, the the great philosopher who says that that God is dead and who 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 lords the idea of of the Superman, um, who will triumph over kind of lesser orders, and and she says, well, you know, looking at at, at what Hitler's written, looking at what they've done up to nineteen thirty eight, um, essentially these this is a pre Christian order, and the ability to harness kind of stupefying architecture, kind of brain numbing architecture and um, massive engineering projects and the strategic use of cruelty and the worship of, of power for its own sake. She sees this as, 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 as Roman, as, of course, Hitler did as well. And in Mein Kampf, he, he specifically says that Roman history is the great teacher. If you want to understand how the world operates, study ancient Rome. And he specifically says about Germania, um, we have to build this because that is the only way that we can triumph over our one true rival, Rome. So Rome is both the model and the rival to be overcome. And I think there's there's a lot in that. Well, um, well, thanks, Tom. Um... But it is really, really interesting. It is, it's, it's so fascinating, which is why a walk with my brother in Cornwall has never wasted time. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very oh, much one Tom of many reasons bro yeah <laughs> fantastic thank you very much Tom that was wonderful thanks a lot cheerio